Hello, hello! Welcome to the awful and awesome entertainment wrap episode three hundred and fifty-five. My name is Abbas, and I'm Nenika. And when the guards are away, the inmates will play, uh, which is a line I haven't said in a long time. Yes, because we haven't the... recorded together in a long time. I'm back That's after true. like months. I don't know how long it's been, but I'm yeah, very yeah, happy to be back. We skipped the entire election cycle. I did. Uh, I skipped the entire election cycle. Yes. Uh, now I'm finally back. So if you miss me, please let me know. <laughs> 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 But before we move on, Nenika, today we're going to talk about uh, two films and uh, actually three films, and uh, I I saw two of them, and mm-hmm. no, you saw one of them. No, we both saw one, and we we both <laughs> have seen one. Abbas, your numbers are a bit off. I saw two of them, and you caught one in the theaters and one like on OTT. On OTT, yes. But before we move into that, I just want to address uh, the last episode that I did with uh, certain with, uh, allegations uh, that have been made against Abbas need to be addressed. So <laughs> not just me, actually, e- equally uh, to Rajshri also. Mm-hmm. But we reviewed Panchayat, and neither of us were very positive on mm-hmm. it. And I think what we did was both of us admitted uh, did the mistake of admitting that we didn't see the show the whole way through. Okay, okay. Rajshri was another level. Rajshri was like, I didn't even see season two. I just straight away dug into season three. But the amount of uh, criticism and mean comments that we have gotten for that, I think I don't think I've gotten for any other episode of uh, Awful and Awesome so far. Fair. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just I can want imagine. to uh, address it in like a a short uh, few minutes, and then we can move on. So the major criticism that we got is that me and Rajshri are too elite to be uh, to be reviewing a show like Panchayat, which is set in a village, because we don't. हम शहर के लोगों को नहीं पता है कि गांव में क्या होता है और कैसे होता है. Abbas, you are too bougie. You've been accused of being too bougie. So well. <laughs> so to my counter to that, largely is that me being bougie should not stop me from having an opinion about a show, and uh, I said that I left after two episodes. so as well the show which just wasn't good enough to keep me hooked for a third episode what can i say so that is broadly my uh, take on panchayat so please keep the feedback coming <laughs> but i want to i want to mention one comment which was very funny somebody had written about that particular episode that uh, this show is a hidden gem which should remain hidden <laughs> it's not hidden by any means but okay <laughs> uh, sure <laughs> So I thought that was very funny, but uh, with that out of the way, uh, I'm sure Rajshri will have more to say about it when she's on the show next. But uh, today we're talking three films. We're talking about uh, Inside Out Two, which is the latest Pixar outing, uh, which is a sequel to the first Inside Out film. We'll be talking about uh, a horror film called The First Omen, which is a prequel to The Omen, which came out in nineteen seventy nine, if I'm not wrong. Seventy six. Seventy six. Okay, okay. okay. our producer wrong. just corrected us. It came out nineteen seventy six. So after twenty or thirty eight years. Yeah. Seventy eighty six ninety six to the yeah after thirty eight years, uh, it's getting a prequel. Uh, so we'll talk about that, and we'll be talking about the the Bakar Banerjee film LSD two, uh, which is Love, Sex, or Dhoka, which is also a sequel. I just realized we're talking two yeah, sequels yeah, and one prequel. <laughs> And none of them are a Marvel movie. What a tragedy! Oh, yeah. I'm fine. You know what? When we started the show, and it was just like every week was me being tortured with one Marvel production after the other, and now they've finally <laughs> gone quiet because they realize there are no profit margins, and I am so happy about it. So yeah, I mean. What more can I can say? I, can I request the producer to bookmark Nanika and me for the Wolverine versus Deadpool episode, <laughs> oh, no. which is which will be in a few weeks? <laughs> oh, don't do this to me. <laughs> Uh, oh, well. So uh, let's start with the film that's in theaters right now, which is Inside Out Two. Um, uh, Nenika, I I am a big fan of Pixar the studio, the animation right. studio, and I've seen Inside Out One. What is your relationship? Have you have, do you remember any of the Pixar films that you've seen or which are close to your heart? Was Monsters Inc. Pixar? <laughs> Yes, Monsters Inc. was Pixar. Yeah, that's then I love that one. One of the one. early ones. Yes, I love that one, and I'm sure I've seen have like you... I've not seen Toy Story in its entirety for sure. Uh, monsters. Any of them? There are four Toy Stories. Well, I haven't watched any of them in their entirety, so. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> but Finding Nemo. Yes, for sure. That one was a that one's like a cult okay. classic outside of the realms of like children's animation in general. So Finding Nemo, of course. Yes. I haven't seen the sequel Finding yes. Dory. So and I haven't seen Inside Out one or two. So. When did Inside One come out? Inside Out One come out, like the first one. Inside Out One came out, I think. Twenty eighteen. Twenty. 
15 or 16 i think okay. if i'm not wrong i wrong. think i was in college by then and i back then i didn't watch as many movies so i definitely haven't watched um, i mean definitely didn't make the trip to the theater to watch that one but i heard great reviews about it people spoke about it for the longest time as a very oh, emotionally intense yes. and beautiful movie even especially for children's entertainment so i had high hopes from inside out too and also because i knew ayo at the very was playing like a important pivotal character in the movie and i'm a huge fan of anything she does so i knew she i'm sure like the movie would have been good and her performance would have been good as well so she's in this one uh, ayo debri is in inside out 2 she wasn't in one okay so very broadly for uh, for the few people who might not know this but pixar's brand is uh, that they make animated films for children but they are very much aimed at adults also and they make adults cry like babies mm-hmm. all right like the the montage from up which is uh, uh, which is this old man who gets married and they're about to have a baby and yeah, yeah. they have a miscarriage and he pass- the wife passes away it's like one of the most viral clips of all time so inside out one i remember i saw it in the theaters back then and for me that's top tier pixar i think mm-hmm. that uh, so in a nutshell inside out is uh, we get a view inside a young girl's mind mm-hmm. uh, and all the various emotions are characters so um so you have amy polar who's playing joy the emotion of joy and then there's anger there's disgust there's fear and there's sadness so the these five emotions kind of make up the uh, they they kind of show this idea where in her head there is a control station and each emotion takes control and based off of that this girl called riley uh, makes her decisions so the first movie in the first movie riley was about a preteen she was i think a 10 or an 11 year old and her family has moved to a new place so um like pixar's imagination is just phenomenal like they they deal with these things called, like uh, imaginary imaginary friends like children have imaginary mm-hmm. friends and then why is it that when we grow up we let go of the imaginary friends so make they make this whole back story of this young elephant uh, called bing bong who makes the ultimate sacrifice and uh, commit commits suicide to make sure that the emotion What? of joy uh, yes in a children's movie in a children's movie so bing bong just does this one ultimate act of sacrifice and jumps into yeah, a world yeah i'm not sure whether we it. should be making kids watch this stuff like <laughs> so and i'm that's very the first film. i'm pretty like i'm pretty liberal when it comes to kids watching weird stuff like my whole philosophy is you're taking you can take a baby to watch anything just hold a hand up over their eye for the weird stuff but even <laughs> this is too much for me <laughs> So in the second movie apart from the five emotions that we were introduced to in the first film we also get introduced to uh, anxiety who is a big emotion in this one we get How anxiety How old is this girl in- Riley in this one So now now Riley is 13 years old oh, so that's the that's, that's the, the concept that, That's the time Yes <laughs> yes now uh, uh, the That's when all that shows up <laughs> that's the film starts with uh, these emotions going about their day and suddenly there is a puberty alert that oh, goes off and uh, they don't know what this is supposed to oh entail gosh. and then suddenly you have these new emotions coming in so you have anxiety embarrassment uh, there's one more whose name i'm forgetting there's ennui which is essentially this uh, sarcasm sarcastic bored of everything kind of a character and they very cleverly give this character a french accent because oh. being bored in french is in a french accent is so funny yeah also uh, where, because ennui uh, yeah, is a french word so yes and ennui is always on her phone all the time ah, like so course. she's this <laughs> <laughs> and that is also a very categorically teen emotion like that is when it yes. gets introduced into your life so uh, so the film is uh, like like sort of divided into two narratives we see what's happening in riley's life which is what's happened is she has gone to a summer camp for, for hockey players because she's she's interested in hockey mm-hmm. and she's kind of divided between going with the cool kids and staying with her old friends right so, so a, and a, a while all this is happening we go inside her head and we see how the emotion of anxiety is trying to take control while joy sadness and uh, these other uh, old old emotions are being pushed aside so then they get sent away and they literally become bottled emotions they are put in a bottle and they are put away in a bank which is her memory bank <laughs> okay and then the rest of the film is about how joy and these uh, original characters sort of uh, they go to the uh, they go to the back of her mind quite literally and they eke out the memories of her being a good person which joy had inculcated in her as a child and they try to bring it back while anxiety is taking control and the climax of the film and this is where pixar like excels so well is a literal panic attack this 13 year old oh. 
oh. girl is having a panic attack and while she's having this we see the literal um, sort of struggle between anxiety and joy happening mm-hmm. so i'm giving a very simplistic version of what's happening when you see the film i heard a uh, the interview of her, of the director on a podcast and he said that he literally went through books written by uh Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung and all these philosophy majors philosophy professors to kind of inculcate those uh, little details in this I love that it is I very love, yeah, it I mean, is very very well made there's one particular sequence which is very funny where these emotions go to the back of Riley's head and she find they find all these things that she has got she had forgotten or gotten rid of so you will have her first video game character crush who is then animated like a video game character then there is a preteen you know like this sesame street type of a character who's like what kids what are we playing today you know like <laughs> that kind of a character so uh, it's a very well paid film please watch it the animation style is phenomenal because it's pixar mm-hmm. and i think pixar needed this win because there since the pandemic they hadn't delivered like a true blue true hit uh, true hit yeah, uh, most of their stuff was going to uh, straight to disney plus but mm-hmm. this one got a theatrical release and, and it uh, did well it's i'm quite happy about it, that it, it has done very well it's got i think 150 million dollar opening mm-hmm. and even the screening that i was was full of kids and adults so that it's nice. doing really well I love movies made well. for kids I feel like kids should always have a theatrical experience and I especially yeah. love the fact that you know the director is like I research so much and I feel like you know ad- uh, like children's entertainment and children's art should be I mean it should be serious it should be just portrayed mm-hmm. in a manner that is friendly to children but I'm always like in complete support of children having an inner life which you know which is allowed to be mature and allowed to have like a you know a strong voice but it's also like friendly to children so I'm happy and I hope I I mean, would you recommend it to parents who want to take their kids out for like the weekend? Oh yes, absolutely. So that's uh, the other thing that uh, there are enough jokes peppered mm-hmm. which will make grown-ups laugh. Oh, but okay. We will be a little too uh, like the the kids will probably miss them. They are meant for the adults, but then there are enough jokes in there which will make both the kids and the adults laugh. So okay, I nice. think uh, there's there's really good stuff in there. So yeah. So yeah, I guess Abbas recommends it. So take the kids in your family, I your do. sons, daughters, nieces, and, and nephews, or out. go yourself. I. Or go Yourself, with another, yes, another friend of absolutely. mine who was an adult very much <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, yeah have fun at the movies okay before we move on i have an announcement to make which is about newsable we have a special announcement for you the news laundry website and app are now accessible newsable is a set of features and system overhauls that make our website and app accessible to people with disabilities the features include screen reader compatibility voice search transcripts color contrast settings dyslexia mode and a lot more neeman lab has a story about our accessibility journey so you can check that out as well uh, so that's something for you guys to check out in case you want to introduce the app and website to uh, your friends who uh, might have a disability uh, all right cool uh, let's move on to our next topic so let's talk about the first omen uh, nenika uh, i was a little surprised when you chose this one because i haven't seen you be very enthusiastic about horror before Ooh, so um i was actually why was <laughs> so yeah i was actually going to get into that like i am not particularly super super inclined towards horror movies cuz i feel like i grew up on horror movies that were just like like horror was b grade straight up like you didn't even have to say b grade horror you just kind of expected that it was a horror movie was going to be like a really really like, bad but, production like what movies are you talking about it i feel like what your um raz and your that's uh, that way, yeah. like at least yeah. in indian cinema horror sort of has taken you know like a slightly lower rung when it comes to being like it's not a prestige genre growing up at Correct. least uh, yes. and then you know uh, i think with the i don't know when exactly like in at least in my like recent memory what i remember mm-hmm. is uh, when get out happened uh, is when you know horror started being taken seriously as a prestige genre mm-hmm. it became yes. something of like an awards favorite it became people realized that there is you know some density there is some depth to it which was missing for the longest time so now horror sort of taken a center stage a slightly better i mean we reviewed nope in 2022 which i thought was one yes. of like the most beautiful movies to come out of uh, that year So you know so I decided to watch the first home and I went into it completely unprompted I wanted something to watch because we needed something to talk about and I was like okay I've been seeing some chatter about it so I went into it completely blind I'd seen like a few memes here and there and people were talking about the movie here and there on social media so I presumed that if it's good enough to be talked about then I'm sure it must not be completely terrible The movie is directed by Arkasha Stevenson and I think it's her first outing uh, I think this is like her first time directing a feature film I'm not sure exactly but she has done such a st- 
stunning job of it and again i'm not opposed to horror as a genre like i don't get squeamish uh, because of things and i don't particularly even get scared easily so it's like uh, horror it doesn't really tickle that spot in my brain that i think it does for some people who go there for the thrill of seeing something scary it doesn't particularly uh, scare me so i went into the movie expecting like okay if it is too gory if it is too weird maybe it won't be my style but turns out the movie is i mean it has gore it's um, mm-hmm. it's not terrifying but again my my threshold for fear is high so I'm, i can't be the perfect judge of it it doesn't have a lot of gore it does have some gory scenes here and there peppered in i think um you know a, a statutory warning for that i guess but the movie is so beautifully composed like you can tell the people making it put a genuine effort into it there are certain shots that just look so gorgeous on the screen that you can tell that you know every single shot was thought about by the director by whoever was behind the camera to actually build something that makes for a coherent beautiful narrative and you know all this effort put into something that is essentially a prequel like i think like the movie stand alone is also very very good it doesn't have to you know borrow from the legacy of its right. i mean the movie of course leads up to the birth of the antichrist quote the unquote antichrist, yeah. which uh, which spoiler, I mean, spoiler alert for the first omen if you haven't <laughs> seen it yeah yeah if you haven't seen the first omen but i mean it came out in 1976 so you could have gotten yeah. your act together you had 38 years <laughs> yeah you had a lot up. of time so <laughs> let's be real uh, but i think the movie is beautifully composed you cannot uh, and i think the yeah, sorry not 38 it must be I am 36. When I was born in 88. Were you, yeah. Sorry, I'm getting my maths really wrong. Today. <laughs> 48. 48 years. Christ. 40 70. Oh my god. The Ooh. 70s are more than 40 years old. Sorry, Ooh. I'm getting Yikes. old. Uh, <laughs> well, that a reality back check to the, brought back to you. to the real horror of the Antichrist. <laughs> I thought the movie was beautifully composed, beautifully done. I think Tiger Nelfry is the name of the actress who plays the character of the Antichrist's mother, and she's done such a beautiful job of it. And there's the scene where she's finally, you know, like. Oh, giving... so they 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 so they show you the mother in this one. Yeah, yeah, that is the backstory is how the mother okay comes to give birth to um. So essentially, that is the meat of the story that they okay. this is a nun and she realizes that you know there's like the church is breeding some sort of program to essentially bring the antichrist into the world because they essentially Ooh. think they'll be able to control the antichrist. Uh so it's a story of how you know she figures out and then there's the scene where the mother is you know uh, giving birth and it's very intense like it's actually like kind of like oppressive to watch in the sense that uh, mm. I mean it's kind of supposed to be like a gory But that's just any scene. child but sorry uh, Yeah that uh, okay <laughs> I guess <laughs> is that is that an anti-feminist thing to no, say? No, I'm no, sorry. it's not. It's not. I mean, it is practically biological horror, so yeah, can't do anything about that. Uh, but you know, so long ago, back when I was like a child, and I couldn't like watch a lot of movies, but I had free access right. to reading newspapers. I remember this uh, very famed uh, director of Kaushik Mukherjee, who goes by the name Q. Uh, who I've never taken seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, unfortunate. I'm yeah. sorry to, <laughs> to say that, but I've never taken him seriously. But I remember reading something in the newspapers where he was talking about, you know, when somebody goes to the theater, I want them so physically activated by my mu- movies that they want to puke. And I was like, and back then I didn't exactly understand. I was like, whatever, <laughs> sure, you're just talking, you're just talking out of your ass. Uh, but then I watched this movie, and then there's that childbirth scene going on, and I was watching the movie on like a laptop screen in the middle of the day. And I was just like, yeah, right. this is gross. Like it's actually causing me. Like it's giving me the feeling of wanting to retch. Uh, so I feel like you know maybe if a movie is so well made and so intense that it actually creates mm. a physical sensation of like wanting to throw up, I feel like it's pretty good. I feel like the job it's an extremely well done job. So mm. thumbs up to this one. If you can handle horror, please go ahead and watch it. If you can't handle horror, I can't give you. like a number rating of how scary it is but i still do think it's a very beautifully made film that deserves your attention so yeah i, I mean, have a question so it. does it have a lot of jump scares no it doesn't and that is why okay. i like i feel like when i mm. so this is one of my things about horror and comedy and which is why i also think horror and comedy as genres are kind of similar is that if to if you have to reply, like, rely on 
jump scares or slapstick humor or sort of just you know being in your face then i just mm. feel like you're not doing a very good job because true mm. horror should like sort of creep up on you it should build into you and to build into your surroundings in a way that makes you genuinely afraid as opposed to just you know relying on the anxiety of the viewer which is why i yeah. really love the remake of suspiria with uh, dakota johnson as well yeah yeah and i yeah. thought it was a very good film like it doesn't it has a little bit of gore here and there it has a bunch of body horror but i don't think it relies on jump scare it's just like that foreboding sense of something being wrong just builds yeah. up on you slowly 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 so yeah i mean two thumbs up it has a lot of wonderful beautiful female characters in the sense that um, i feel like again horror is a genre that belongs to women in the sense that you know women live a life with a lot of fear and it ties to fears of like you know yeah your body there's this Go yeah ahead. there's this new strain of horror again which is like this prestige horror like a sub genre of this prestige horror thing where a lot of the um, protagonists are women mm. and the, the the difference being that in the 70s and 80s the woman used to be like the victim like she was always running exactly, away from exactly. the from the slasher right and now it's almost like they're reclaiming the space yeah, and absolutely. They, they are the uh, they are the monster True. or they are the manifestation of the monster in many cases yeah i mean it so again it plays on those themes that you know you're right absolutely that at a point mm-hmm. uh, women were the flesh upon which there was being preyed upon in slasher mm-hmm. fix and slasher horror mm-hmm. uh, flicks but now in the sense that it gives women a lot more agency uh, it allows women to be monsters it allows women to at least like be like the final girl type of characters which i think mm-hmm. makes a very interesting story telling and even yeah. this movie narratively it's set in like a little church which is also a little convent for like little orphanage for little girls so it's like you see all this like horrifying shit happening with the background of like just little girls playing around so it just really you know like braids that narrative of something being truly truly wrong in otherwise positive seeming surroundings so i feel felt like the movie was pretty solid can i tell you two interesting facts about the original omen oh yeah i haven't so, watched uh, that one so i'm completely what did you think about it and so, please tell me the facts as well so it's uh, i i have a soft spot for 70s horror i think the exorcist is one of my favorite films of all time not just horror films uh the omen is not as scary but like quite legendary but interestingly so the soundtrack of the omen had these very creepy gregorian chants and surprisingly that song the gregorian chant song actually reached i think number 1 on the billboard charts that's how that is insane <laughs> that's how successful <laughs> the film was <laughs> that all these pop stars were behind and the second interesting thing is so there's a very pivotal scene in the in the first uh, omen again spoiler alert guys where the father of the child comes to know that the child is an antichrist while the child is sleeping and he goes to the bed and he parts the child's hair and he sees a, he sees the uh, the number 666 tattooed mm-hmm. on his scalp mm-hmm. okay and after the movie came out there were numerous cases of parents actually going and checking their children oh. in the night and their <laughs> did anyone find a 666 <laughs> tattoo <laughs> uh, i don't know it's a great way to uh, to sort of uh, you know this thing to well fun fact about your fun parents. fact about me i have two bumps on my skull exactly where like devil horns would be you know so... what when you said i was a child and you uh, told me the q story i thought you were going in that direction when i was a child i was once taken over by the devil <laughs> <laughs> well that's really believable for a lot of people i presume but uh, i mean i don't know if you ask my parents they'd be like yeah she was definitely controlled by the <laughs> antichrist for a while <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, But so yeah. I'll check out. I, it it has been on my uh, watch list. You have to watch it. We out. have to talk about it whenever you. I will. Do, I will. So I'll check out the first omen. Uh, okay, before we move on, we have a uh, email, a subscriber email, which comes from Tanya. So Tanya says, "Hi, Rajshri and Abbas. I wanted Abbas to know that." I too remember watching the Jungli Tufan tire puncture as a kid. Wow, uh, Tanya, you're the first person who has admitted to it. I'll fill uh, a nanika up in a minute. Uh, she continues to say it used to air on Z TV, and some dialogues from the show are etched in my brain. Like we are not mad, we are pagal. <laughs> also, who remembers subscribing to Target magazines as a kid? I used to love reading Gardab Das, Moochwala, etc. Tanya, I don't remember Target magazine, but I used to subscribe to Lot Port. and they used to have characters like motu patlu etc who i remember uh, tanya continues to say you guys should host a deep dive into pop culture of the 80s and 90s from tv cult classics like byomkesh bakshi malguri days and even chandra kanta to the syndicated us shows we watched for the first time like i dream of jini dogi hauser the wonder years to film song countdowns like philips top 10 and channel v the channel v is bheja fry 
and call abhinandan too who can represent the 70s wow okay. <laughs> he can also tell us about the omen maybe oh yeah uh, but yeah <laughs> Thank you so much, Tanya. So, uh, uh, Nenika, I had last episode. I asked uh, uh, the watch- watchers and listeners of uh, ANA that uh, there used to be a '90s puppet show uh, called Jungli Tufan Tire Puncture because because we were talking about a uh, Benedict Cumberbatch where he plays mm-hmm. a puppeteer, mm-hmm. and uh, there's this show which used to come, and I I have I, mean, I I I felt like I was the only one who remembers that because nobody else I have met has memory of this. But now Tanya has written in. telling us that she has memory of this so thank you so much tanya uh the uh, tv cult classics from 90s and 80s maybe we should look at doing it yeah we should uh, i mean i'm not the curator here so shubhang our producer please uh, <laughs> uh ye message apne superiors tak pahuncha dena in additional news we have another announcement we have new prince of the book kashmir ki kahani by sumit kumar for the unacquainted it is a collection of rare stories of off and about kashmir with sumit infusing a sense of the absurd and dark humor into the grave narrative order your copy at newslaundry.com/store our last movie for this episode that we're going to be talking about is uh, love sex or dhoka part 2 which is directed by dibakar banerji This is an anthology which explores a number of issues related to our increasing dependence on social media and virtual reality. This is a very bare bones one line synopsis of the film. Uh Nenika before I ask your opinion. Mm-hmm. I have to give you my opinion because of I have course. lots to say um, about this. I I I got a feeling you would have a <laughs> lot to say about it. Go ahead. Okay, I will be straightforward without wasting much time. I think this is the fa- my favorite film of this year so far. Okay. 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 We're six uh, months into the year, so any, that's a tall claim. That's a very tall claim, I know. But I am anyway a big fan of Dibakar Banerjee. I think, for my money, he's the best uh, director working in Hindi cinema today. I think he doesn't get enough credit that uh, that, that he deserves. What's your favorite Dibakar film? My favorite Dibakar film? Mm-hmm. Uh, Oil Akio Akio. Fair. I heard yes, yeah, uh, really. but I think he's not made a bad film so far. In fact, every film of his, I take away something. Uh, I think I was one of the few people back in two thousand nine or ten, whenever the first LSD came out, who went in the theater to watch it. Mm-hmm. I remember it was an extremely polarizing film. Have you seen the first LSD? Uh, dude, I was. I think I was in sixth grade, so there is <laughs> no so way I could have watched that one. <laughs> actually, yeah, wrong. Bad question, yeah. sir. I <laughs> take it back. <laughs> uh but the first lsd also had a profound impact on me that one was uh, same uh, sort of concept anthology of three stories each story was a found footage film uh and it blew me away it uh, it dealt with uh, topics like honor killing and uh, you know uh, societal hypocrisy and all of that I think LSD two is that, but like on steroids. I yes. think it well, is the steroids part. A, I will hundred percent relate to. It is such a great depiction of like this Orwellian nightmare that we are living in right now, where everybody just wants uh, this approval from people, strangers on the internet. Uh, it touches upon reality shows. It touches upon homophobia. It touches upon this very extreme sort of uh, the the sort of dark place that we are pushing our youth into. um but without giving further away anika what did you think of it ma to matlab ma to ekdam bored over ho gaya like i it's a, such a shame that this barely got to play in theaters i think it was in the halls for like a week mm-hmm. and then it was out but man i was blown away dibakar i love you if you're watching <laughs> this <laughs> okay so abbas is oh, clearly you, uh, yeah abbas's profession of love is something that we just got to hear I will okay I honestly I'm I think I'm still digesting the movie like it's not still yes. at a place where I can comment comment on it but I will definitely say that when I watched it it stayed with me it was not a film that you could just easily watch and forget and it did feel like it was a bit of a crime that it never got to play in theaters because I feel like it would have been even more hard hitting if it got to play in the theaters it mm. um, initially i was like okay maybe does it borrow like a certain amount of themes from black mirror etc and i haven't exactly yeah. watched black mirror i think i watched like one season of it maybe here and there uh but even then i was just like i don't think it's exactly like Bl- black mirror i mean the themes are similar but it would be reductive to compare it to that because it is because it is not about you know human interfacing with technology i think it's about technology sort of the background character of everything that happens here but it's still very much about you know human vulnerability human desire to perform human desire to survive you know what it means to want to 
you know how you interact with fame how you interact with being known and not knowing how to handle fame or what fame means so i felt like the themes were very complicated and technology or reality tv or the thing about being a spectacle was sort of the background notes of this entire process i thought it was intense to watch i mean i i'm still processing it it was triggering for me like at, especially the last one i think there were bits and parts of it that were very difficult for me to digest emotionally but i still do think that it was i feel like it's a movie that will gain its laurels through time that's sure. true yeah i i i really hope so uh, i just want to like talk about each of the stories in a nutshell so the first one is like this hybrid reality show which is a cross between big boss indian idol and dance india dance true they sort of just like and an algorithmic mix of all you know if you yes, asked ai yeah, to be yeah. like okay can you come up with like one indian reality tv show it this is the response it would give you it's like a weird sort of a thing where you can you can be you know online for as long as you want you can have people looking at you as long as you want or you can choose to go offline yeah, etc yeah. and then there is that you know that you are still performing to the audience people are coming in looking into what you've been doing and they they ask you questions you're supposed to do things bring yeah. your the reality of your life out to people it's very complicated like even i didn't understand the rules of it entirely but it's very intense to watch because it features a trans woman and yes. uh, the it, the story starts off with her saying that you know i'll bring in my mother who clearly is not somebody she has maintained contact with ever since she transitioned no actually it's the it's the it's the show people who are like why don't you bring in yeah, your mother yeah, because then we'll have this extra angle yeah yeah So she does it for TRPs. Comes in, yeah. Exactly. So she does it for TRPs. That okay, I'll reconcile. I'll try to attempt to reconcile with my mother, who I haven't seen ever since I began transition. And uh, you know, the mother comes in, and it's like a lot of friction because the mother is still struggling to accept that the child has transitioned. The mother has has her own issues. And uh, so, Nanika, I think we spoke about this before. You're not you're not a big boss watcher, are you? I watched like the early seasons I think a little bit here and there but okay. never after okay. that. What about you? So I thought I th- I uh, I mean same uh, early big boss ardent watcher of uh, mm-hmm. uh, the early seasons. The later seasons it's like it's one of those like everything I know about big boss I've learned against my will you know because there's so many people around me. <laughs> I feel like okay I'll be boss. honest I feel like it fell in prestige through each season and it didn't have a lot of prestige to True. begin with let's be honest yeah, yeah. but at least at least the first few seasons they were still able to pull like respectable people to yeah, yeah, come yeah. and star in it and then over time it just sort of devalued where they realized it wasn't exactly family entertainment because even I remember during one of the initial seasons they had to change the timing slot from 8 PM to later in the night to nine nine thirty because they were like yeah, this yeah, is not yeah. family entertainment. Yes, so to sort yes. of you know keep bringing in the TRPs, keep juicing in the TRPs, they had to mm-hmm. move away from the TV segment. Eventually, it became an OTT sort of like TV plus OTT, yeah, yeah, yeah. and now it's purely OTT. If I'm not wrong. now, it's both. There's a oh, okay. there's a TV version and there's an OTT version. I think they both happen within a span of a couple of months of each other. Okay. Uh, but the reason I brought that up is because I think the Big Boss inspired scenes that they they have done for mm. LSD. Oh, two those are very are spot on, very realistic. Yeah, and then they they cut to these three judges who are played by Anu Malik, Tushar Kapoor, and Sophie Choudhary. Yes. And uh, I don't know how they Bakar shot them. I don't know how much Anu Malik is in on the joke that he's <laughs> <laughs> he's playing a version of himself. He is playing a version but, of himself for sure. Yeah, it's absolutely bizarre. It's absolutely very well done. uh you, the the thing is he's also inserted these helicopter shots from shows like khatro ke khiladi and True. all for no reason yeah, as you know, i said is... you know an ai algorithmic mix of <laughs> yes. and you know it's so well done because i even the it's lighting so well the way the camera works etc like there's a specific harsh sort of focus on each contestant which is yeah. emblematic of reality tv shoots as opposed to the rest of the anthology which is shot a little differently so you can tell yeah, that he's yeah, yeah. like he's really even the graphics they look kind of campy and sketchy yeah, like they always do uh, impactful is happening there's a graphic saying ke kya wo apna link change kar payenge apne exactly. text kijiye yeah, you know yeah yeah and it's all like a very campy looking graphic also when they have yes. like you know cuts and bits and pieces from the news so they also yeah. have those tickers running on the side so i feel like you know great uh, attention to detail for this uh, yeah, 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 yeah. so 100% uh, the second, gets it for that the second story is about uh, again it has a transgender character at the at the helm of it mm-hmm. and it deals with uh, Uh, this transgender character works at a met. It's implied yes. that they Kulu work at a metro Karma. station, yes. and uh, there 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 is a crime that has been committed, and uh, the, the our protagonist is kind of involved with that. And then there's this secondary character who's sort of like uh, she's the in charge of the of 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 the of the committee that takes care of the uh, 
uh the 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 well being of the station she's mm-hmm. she's like the corporate head right and what dibakar plays with is that again while watching this of course i will connect more with the english speaking elite uh, woman than with the with the trans character yeah. and he does this thing where it's like for 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 matlab uh, dikhane ke liye we will act as if we we are fighting for the rights and for the justice mm-hmm. of the oppressed people but, but the, the background is that, entirely selfish the, exactly the moment that uh, particular uh, uh, situation changes and you come under the radar you are going to uh, you know uh, flip in a second Correct. that is when your privilege will come and sort of take hold of you Correct. and you're like uh, i i don't i want none of this uh i i just want to mention the name of the uh, actor who bonita plays uh, kullu who is the yeah, boni- protagonist there bonita rajpurohit is a trans woman and uh, yes. she plays the character which is different because the contrast because noor who plays the trans woman in the first one is play is a cis male actor i think it's paritosh yes, tiwari yes. Uh, if i'm not yeah. mistaken at the name so there's that also that contrast that they've chosen a trans character to play a trans character and there's also yeah. you know one anthology where that's not the case uh, so i felt yes. like that was interesting that was a choice and, for sure and, and the third story which is uh, of of this carry minati like gamer character which is played by abhinav singh and the character ga- uh, na- character goes by the name of game papi mm-hmm. uh I just want to talk about Nenika the last 15 minutes of this film. Again, yeah, I don't want to give this, this was, away because if it you was a seen. very difficult one for me to watch. Like not in the sense that it was bad in the sense that it's emotionally okay. quite intense. Uh mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I mean the last 15 minutes go ahead. <laughs> no, but why was it why was it why was it why, why was this section more difficult? I think personally because the they have that scene of that child uh, that wasn't okay. something that I was okay with. Okay. uh no last 15 minutes i mean look this this film is produced by ekta kapoor and i'm like man ekta kapoor kudos to her for giving the director this wild reign of going absolutely nuts in the last 15 minutes because you'll never see coming what's going to happen oh, what yeah, the climax yeah. of this film will be you will not absolutely i also i feel like ekta kapoor as a producer maybe trumps ekta kapoor as a director i don't know absolutely I mean. yes i give uh, 100% agree with you i think she's very smart she has taken way more chances when she's producing films True. so the first lsd was also produced by oh, ekta kapoor oh i didn't kapoor. know that about her yeah and i think she's she's produced the last couple of dibakar banerjee films and otherwise also like of course we can call her out for making television regressive through saas bahu serials and <laughs> the ullu app which is essentially a soft porn app and all oh, of that really? but i yeah 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 i i think ullu was a balaji app which was like full of these salacious soft porn programs i had no clue interesting <laughs> now you do <laughs> now I, okay but i think but when she takes a swing i think she does uh, i think she she's does very, very she's well. a great business woman but she also has taste yes. so she does interesting tasteful things on the side and uh, i mean a question to be raised i'm just being too flippant here but you know who's uh, who's had a better you know filmography in terms of projects they've supported zoya akhtar or <laughs> ekta kapoor or ekta kapoor wow okay <laughs> uh what's the question who's had the most successful run uh who's had the more you know impactful i suppose in terms of oh impactful i think both are catering to different audiences Absolutely. i think zoya is very much catering bougie. to a very yeah the bougie audience that you were just accused yeah. of being <laughs> and i think uh, ekta knows that she can reach both so i think she True. picks and chooses her she does her, that thing uh, where she knows that she'll make money with the kind of business decisions she's taken yeah, uh, yeah. and she also has dis- i mean surprisingly she has great discernment and good taste which is i feel yeah. like her uh, create a partnership with dibakar banerjee is something quite valuable because i do think dibakar banerjee makes pretty solid films so yeah absolutely but I've yeah last never, 15 I mean, minutes of uh, this particular last third anthology yeah i mean look i don't want to give anything away but the film takes a like it it goes into the realm of what should i call it make believe it, it takes a leap it <laughs> takes a massive leap and you'll either buy into it or you won't but My thing was man I can only imagine how Dibakar Banerjee sold this idea to them that this is how the film will end. <laughs> uh, and it's just it's just absolutely bizarre. Please watch the film only for those last 15 minutes. It's it's one of the most uh inspiring endings. So I do I want I've to ask like movie. it's definitely yeah. a twisted film that I'm not sure if I'd be open to recommending to others purely because I just I feel like it's um 
it's too sharp it's too incisive in certain ways so i want to hear mm-hmm. like what do you would you like blindly recommend tell everyone just like shout I from would. the rooftops that you go and watch Man, it or what do you I will, what are your disclaimers I will, say, I will say this i will take this any day over your bade mia chote mia your so your, that's okay your, you know that's your, your hit barrage is too of low. propaganda <laughs> action films the nationalistic propaganda where you can go do a tick mark of oh ha now they'll make a now they'll sing a patriotic song now he will do some dialogue bazi where he will abuse pakistanis and do this and do that i'm like bollywood is so bankrupt hindi cinema is so bankrupt with ideas right now that something as ballsy as this uh, when it comes along i'm like sure it's a difficult film to watch i'm not saying it's a feel good film by any stretch oh, yeah, of yeah, the imagination absolutely. Not. but please support this kind of cinema otherwise you'll be stuck with getting this bland sort of you know either it'll just be your nationalistic propaganda films or it'll be your bland uh, kind of whatever mr and mrs mahi type of mm-hmm. like no no shade on the people who are making that kind of film but those films don't have ideas those films those films don't have a they're creatively a, a bankrupt in some make. way yeah yeah they, they they are made for palatable audiences and that's fine most of the time but man it's the i mean lsd2 just blew me away i was like this is the film of our times this is very much what i want to see uh, being represented what's happening in the country right now and what's uh, what we are surrounded with i was blown away interesting i do i mean i will hesitate a little to call it like you know the movie of our times i mean it definitely okay. uh i felt but like isn't it i mean i mean it definitely here, see again it definitely uh, dwells into the topics that you need to but i personally think that even the topics that they're dealing into there's like a touch of irony or a touch of distance to it like you know even when they're dealing with these topics it's sort of like observing the topics from a certain distance and then making a film about it it doesn't fully probably like all aspects of it don't feel as real or believable to me not in the sense that it's done wrong at all i just feel like mm-hmm. you know again how perfect can you go with a narrative or story that is already a bit convoluted so you know nothing against um, the people who made this film i still think it's quite valuable i still think it's brilliant i do still think it maintains a little bit of distance from the subjects it's trying to capture but that's okay i don't think that gets in the way of a good uh, of a good movie i still think it's quite valuable to watch i mean okay. if you have the stomach to like if you can stomach like slightly like a movie that it isn't easy that it isn't easy to watch you can just want to just want to remind that 10 minutes ago you were like so i saw a movie where there was a, a woman giving birth to an antichrist <laughs> and that was fine <laughs> you can watch that well that was easy because you were like because you know it's not real <laughs> that's a, that's a good distinction yeah. yeah that's that's far removed from reality exactly and this one is not removed like from reality like this scary yeah. stuff is stuff that could 100% be happening around you in really twisted ways and you know yeah, another yeah, thing yeah. was very interesting that a lot of like uh, a lot of those stories just seem like uh, newspaper like bizarre newspaper headlines you'd read at some point mm-hmm. like a uh, child did this or um this is what happened and you know so you're just like very much you very much accept the reality of everything that can happen in this nation and mm-hmm. uh, I, in this nation i'm using liberally because i'm sure i i know for a fact that a decent chunk of the movie was like shot in noida so i'm like yeah this kind of stuff can happen in noida for sure <laughs> even the metro platform was the aqua line that famously travels through noida so i was right, like oh right. of course <laughs> not surprising actually you know what that's the thing about dibakar banerji is like i am i have someone who, who doesn't live hasn't spent much time in delhi but for me i think he represents the deliness of cinema so well is like he khosla from khosla delhi i'm Ki. surprised i don't know is he from delhi okay is he is I, he I, must I, be from he must have lived I in delhi i remember for a good my friend delhi. told me the story that he was watching tatli i think where like some characters being murdered and in the background mm. you can see a building and he's like the background building is where i used to live so <laughs> it's a uh, so noida is pretty pretty much well anyway ah, so maybe maybe that's why it's too close literally too close to home yeah, for yeah it's too close to home for a lot of people including me <laughs> cool okay so definitely recommendation from me thumbs up and anika is also recommending it with but with caveat a cautious caveats. recommendation like don't be yeah. like okay i'm looking for something to watch with my dinner <laughs> let me fire up lsd2 no just like you know like clear up your mind declutter a little bit like take a bath and then sit down to watch it <laughs> so like sort of you know nice. uh, i feel yeah. like i'll be digesting the movie i do not know if i have the balls to revisit it i i honestly i'm not sure if i have the emotional so composition to do that even i agree that, that I, it's not the kind but, of yeah. i'm like i want to watch it rewatch it again yeah. right now i want to 
like have my distance from it but i will revisit it at some point but yeah, uh, yeah so that's the end was, of the year yeah. if it still remains your favorite movie that came out of bollywood or not because i am quite yes, curious yes. but it's interesting uh, that you know you like I'm it enough to say i'm saying it's my favorite film movie bollywood hollywood all combined that, it's my favorite okay, film of the year okay, yes okay quite yes. quite intense <laughs> i'm sad it flopped in the theaters i think uh, because all the actors also i feel like they've done a decently good job Very i feel like job, they yeah. weren't as many big names associated with the project mm-hmm. so it probably i don't know people didn't feel the need to go and watch it and definitely like the marketing was abysmal cuz i didn't even know there was a sequel yeah. to lsd coming out at any point i only got to know about it when i found out that we'll be watching it for the episode so i feel like the marketing was abysmal and even netflix didn't put anything into kind of you know pushing it do, onto do you know too, netflix so. is sitting on a dibakar banerji film a fully made dibakar banerji film that they are not releasing why are they not releasing it, it? it's called tees it's about okay. three generations of a muslim family oh yeah <laughs> i can releasing. tell why they're not releasing Haan, it so they're not releasing because dibakar was told that this is not the correct time okay. correct time in quotes uh-huh. to be releasing this so he's shopping the film around but yeah netflix man man up and release the film if you I mean that's what they did with, I think that that's what they were going to do with monkey man as well right uh, it, monkey man to they gave away they had they gave away because they were like yeah. there's no way we're going to release this yeah. in india which actually is a, a little thing that we didn't discuss of course but uh, two of the films were in the news recently which was one was uh, maharaj which was the junaid khan True. film which has been stayed uh, the release has been stayed by the court and another was hamare bara which has also been uh, stayed by the court uh, stayed yes. by the supreme court to uh, for release so yeah these are the times we live in where uh, these films... are the times we live in where there's like uh, unprecedented censoring of movies i feel like india also was i remember reading about it a long ago that india was the nation that banned the most number of books and i think the controversy yeah, yeah, came I'm not of, surprised yeah, about so... that i mean india was the first nation that banned salman rushdie's satanic verses mm-hmm. before even the fatwa was issued india True. had banned we the book we are really. uniquely censorious for like a fully functioning fully fledged democracy <laughs> which i mean again uniquely censorious is a is a very mild way to put it <laughs> but yes <laughs> well we're not china so much to ponder if that's uh, if that's the benchmark <laughs> that i don't think <laughs> uh fair But uh, but yeah, sure. That brings us to the end of this week's so episode like of the. So I think this is quite a also. full episode. Like I think everything we watch, we recommend it because usually a lot of times, fifty percent of the stuff is just like don't even bother with this shit. Do not even <laughs> spend a single second of your time on this shit. Definitely don't pay for this shit. <laughs> so especially if it's panchayat. But oh, we'll not go there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I see you're still coming in with the punches despite the criticism. So I feel like you really stand on your opinion. I respect that. I do. I pass. do. Yes. Yeah. All right with that we come to a close on this week's episode. Thank you so much to Shubang and Anil sir for all the behind the scenes work for this episode. Thank you Ms. Rathor. Thank you Mr. Momin. And it's a wrap. You can fund journalism that solely works for you. That is our motto at News Laundry. You can pay to keep news free so that news becomes accountable to you just like it's supposed to be. Visit newslaundry.com and become a paying subscriber so that you can pay to keep news free and independent.